Hallelujah. Bless the day of the Lord, everyone. You're welcome to the service today. This is the King's Court Bible Teaching, Prayer, and Leadership Development Service. Uh, we're going to continue from uh, a series we started on Sunday that we titled Overcoming Victory in the Blood of the Lamb. Overcoming Victory in the Blood of the Lamb. This will be part two. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for privilege to be called sons of God, children of God. Thank you for the efficacy of the blood of Jesus that not only delivered us from the powers of darkness, forgave, forgave us of our transgressions, but cleansed us also and provided, made for us, consecrated for us a new and living way by which we may please the Father. A new and living way to, that we might be called sons of God. We thank you. Thank you for the power of the blood. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher, guide us, guide us into all truth, unveil truth to us, glorify Jesus, and we say amen and amen and amen. You're welcome again, the King's Scott Bible Teaching, Prayer and Leadership Development Service. Uh, the photo head we have there, I want to give credit to stock.adobe.com for that photo head. I try to get away from any particular image that could be discernible. So I look for an outline, an outline, but we know the event is a true event, so there's no denying that. And uh, <clears throat> it's definitely um, related to the message. It's a matter of fact, integral to the mes message. So I had to, you know, use something that was applicable. All right, so we titled this Overcoming Victory in the Blood of the Lamb, and this is part two. So we started off, all of this came from Revelation chapter 12. And this particular message, or this particular topic, uh, we, we did, did, um, you know, did, deduced from Revelation 12, verse 11. And in verse 11, it, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's where we are right now. We're going to come to by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. But we are at, at, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. That's what we're looking at. So we call it the overcoming victory in the blood of the lamb. And this is part two. So in that Revelation 12, verse 11 that we just read, we see a prophetic insight as to how God's people may overcome the dragon. And again, the dragon is Satan, the devil. Scriptures are very clear on that one. So, which means that that is a prophetic insight, that is a prophetic declaration, a prophetic statement that says to all humanity, that says to all of humanity, it is possible to overcome this dragon. It is possible to overcome Satan. Not as if you, you're going to engage him in a fight one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we're not asked to do that. We're not called to do that. All the Bible tells us to do is to resist, resist, resist. And I know some people talk about, you know, demons dying. You don't see that in scriptures. You know, in, in the days that are to come, um, we have chosen to be very, very straightforward and strict with truth, biblical truth. If we cannot support it with biblical truth, there's no point defending it or holding onto it. I get it. In the days of ignorance, God winked at. One time we were all ignorant about certain things. We didn't even bother. But now it's becoming clearer to us that truth is a construct. And we cannot just, you know, keep just fumbling and wobbling and fumbling and hoping that we'll arrive at the, you know, the, 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 the target. No, truth is a construct. Truth is deliberately constructed. Truth is intelligent design if you will it's a product of intelligent design because you're dealing with the alpha and the omega the first and the last the beginning and the end so there is no perchance with him there is no let's just you know trial and error no truth is a construct and if it's a construct then it was predetermined if it's a construct it was done with intelligence if it's a construct then it has a destination a predetermined destination so we got to walk in truth. And truth is something that is critical to the kingdom of God. 
Again, we've talked about this, uh, Psalm 8914. Your throne, O God, founded upon righteousness, justice, mercy, and truth. See that? The Lord Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit, when he, the spirit of truth, will come. See that? The gospel, the gospel of truth. So truth is critical to everything God does. So the idea of just, just you know, Oh, don't criticize, don't, don't call it out, don't say, just, just carry along, just let everybody be happy, everybody be merry. You don't need to know, we can't do that. Because that is what the enemy thrives on. He is the master of deception, the master of falsehood. And you know, saints of God, if it's not total truth, if it's not complete truth, and there's an iota or element of falsehood in it, then to that degree, you're going to have to deal with the deceiver, the, the one who is the father of lies, the originator, the maker, the one who himself concocts lies. Oh my God, I, things are coming to my head, but I can't go there for time's sake. All right, so this scripture shows us it's possible. And how is it possible? It's possible because if we stay with scriptures, if we stay with the word of God, if we stay with the word of truth, then you know we'll find that overcoming victory. And so what does scripture say about overcoming? First and foremost, the truth is that it is possible to overcome. Now, again, overcoming here, we try to explain that um, in one of the lessons. What does scripture mean when it says overcome? It doesn't mean you say who, and then sit down and run away. That's not what it means. Overcoming with some meant a different thing from biblical perspective, right? The Lord Jesus, for instance, would say, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But guess what? He went to the cross. He was the same one who was crucified. But even in the crucifixion, he said, I have overcome. So overcoming doesn't mean you come out unscathed. It doesn't mean you are untouched. It doesn't mean at the sound of your voice, all the demons disappear, run away. No, that's not what it means. And by the way, that's not <laughs> always the case, if it's at all true. But overcoming means that we are able to stay the cause because the goal of this satanic agenda is to bend humanity. It's called the mystery of iniquity. And iniquity comes to bend. Iniquity has the power and the ability to bend things from their original intent, from their original divine purpose. See that? Iniquity took a hold of the guy that we now know as Satan, but, but before now it was called Lucifer. He said, you were, you were perfect in all your ways until iniquity was found in you. Iniquity took that guy, bent him over, bent him until he became Satan, the devil, the dragon, the deceiver, the accuser. He was not created that way. And God did not intend for him to go that way. But iniquity is a force. Now, where did iniquity come from? Some people will ask, Satan concocted it. Because of free will, we've dealt with these subjects before. If you go back to our YouTube pages, you know, I think God has given us some beautiful subjects in the, you know, in our in our local house. So uh, we've dealt with that. Satan had free will, just like humans were given free will, but with his free will, he was able to concoct by what we call or by the principle of what we call perverse creativity. Every human is creative. God put creativity in us. But see what creativity has done in the earth. People are, can be creative until they create evil. See that? The same people who are producing nuclear weapons and bombs and all can produce things that will benefit mankind. But perverse creativity causes them to go a different route. But it didn't start with the humans. It started with this being that we now know as Satan, the devil. So this message is indeed for all who truly desire to overcome the dragon. And I say it that way because there will be some who do not want to overcome the devil. There will be some who are loyal to the devil. There will be some who find or think or in their perverted thinking will consider the ways of the devil better than serving God. Yeah. Yeah. And the earlier you evangelists note that, the better for us. Because, you know, people think that, oh, once I go out and preach the gospel, they must be saved. And so we've watered down the gospel just for the, you know, to bring people in. And so you have a mixed multitude. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't do that. I mean, the rich man came to him, uh, you know, 
What must I do to be saved? Oh, what does the Lord say? So I've done all of that. Okay, well, go and do this. Sell all your goods. Give the money to the poor. Come, take up your cross and follow me. And the man got angry and left. Jesus didn't say, oh, wait a minute. Why are you leaving? Oh, you don't like what I said? Okay, come, 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 come. Let's, 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 let's talk. It so, you know, let's be diplomatic. Let's change it. No, Jesus didn't do that. His disciples even came to him and said, do you know that guy was angry? He said, leave him alone. Let him go. <laughs> Let him go, right? He said, how hard it is for those who put their trust in riches to go in, to come into the kingdom of God. So Jesus wouldn't water down the truth, okay? And so church leaders, don't water down the truth just because you're trying to grow large numbers. The, the, as a matter of fact, the church of Jesus Christ, the Bible says God is the one who adds, he adds daily as many as are being saved. All right, it's not us who grow the church of Jesus. All we do is disseminate the message he's given us, you know, live the life he's called us to live. The growth, the actual growth of the church is in the hands of the Lord Jesus, in the hands of the Father, as many as the Father has called to himself. All right, so this message is for those who truly desire to overcome the dragon, all right? The quest to overcome the dragon begins with desire. Now, and I'm carefully saying this thing, saints of God, because that's the way of truth. So again, the first truth we've seen is it is possible to overcome. It is possible to not be bent by the enemy. It is possible to not take the bait of Satan. It is possible to weather the storm of, you know, opposition that comes from the mystery of iniquity. This is what it means to overcome, to not be bent. It is possible to hold on to the faith to the very end, even in the face of death. It is possible. Don't The, the, the lie the enemy will want to sell is it's not possible. So when you look at people who are falling, so everybody is doing No, not everybody is doing it. Don't believe that lie of the devil. Not everybody is doing it. The Bible said, look for those who serve the Lord in truth and in righteousness. That's the ones you should follow, right? So when you when you agree everybody is doing it and then you lower down your standards or you don't see that you can truly overcome, then that's a problem. But the truth of God's word is it is possible to overcome. They overcame him. And by the way, that statement is in the past. It's in the past tense because it's a prophetic uh, picture coming from the end, looking back in time. Picture of the end, but looking back in time. So they overcame him. The angel is saying from the perspective of the end, we can look back in time and tell you they overcame him. So some indeed overcame the dragon. Now our prayer is that we are a part of those overcomers, those overcomers in the faith, those overcomers in the kingdom. And that should be your desire. That should be your prayer as, as well as a child of God. So it begins with desire. Do you desire to overcome? Or do you want to just settle? Or do you want to just take whatever comes? Or do you want to just give, you know, whatever, God, this is all I got, God, you better take it or leave it. If you're like that, then this message is not going to help you as much. But there are those who really want to get all that God has for them. And when I say that, I don't mean bless material blessing because people have turned these things to only material blessings. Every, everything you can apply for material blessings, you can apply for spiritual blessings as well. You can apply for spiritual growth. You can apply for kingdom advancement, not just material gain. So the desire to overcome the dragon comes with first and foremost knowledge. And I said this on Sunday. It's not about faith. It's not about belief. I'll give you a very good example. We, you know, here in the United States, a lot of protests are going on uh, in, 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 in many of the, uh, you know, uh, um, schools of learning, higher schools of learning, especially the Ivy League schools all around, the, you know, not all, but in parts of the country. And these are the ones that we've been told are the best schools in town, the best, the best schools there are, they pay heavy sum, you know, parents and students pay a heavy sum to be in those schools. When they do graduate, they are considered the best, you know, the, 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 the creme de la creme, you know, they, they get the best jobs in the, in the, in the society and in the country, but, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> but look at what's going on. 
that certain things that are that should be obvious from a commonsensical perspective seem to have you know been disregarded like they don't they don't care about so again it's belief now why did i go into this they, because yeah they had the belief they had belief for them is belief but you see but this is why i wanted to say so journalists went to you know uh, uh, interview some of them. Number one, they don't want to talk. They don't want to even debate. See, those high schools of learning ought to be places of debate, also be places of exchange of ideas. As a matter of fact, that's what education should be. Education should be about being able to you know hold various thoughts, compare, be able to defend your position, you know, in in a free society where there's free speech, where there is you know a, a exchange of ideas, and so the better ideas should come up when you go back when we dealt with uh, academia that was there in fact even the the the, the socrates and the and the uh, you know uh, 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 all of those folks uh that was the thought the thought was the best thinkers in society should be the ones who lead society and so how do the best thinkers come forth out of a place of you know exchange of ideas debate and dialogue opposing views and and so the those who are able to postulate better ideas should be the ones who lead society that's the whole thing about academia but what we see today is totally oh my god the opposite of that where you're shouting down your fellow students you're stopping them from going to class you you don't want them to because they don't agree with what you are holding on to bring it to the table of ideas let's discuss let's dialogue right that's how it should be. But this journalist went there and was asking one of them questions about, you know, what exactly are you protesting? Do you know they couldn't tell? They couldn't say exactly what. They just, uh, you know, from chanting a particular chant from the river to the sea. So she asked, which river are we talking about? Which sea are we talking? She couldn't tell. She don't know what the river is. She don't know what the sea is. Well, it must be a sea that is between Israel and Palestine. Like, whoa. So even before you got out there to skip class, stay out in the in the sun, in the cold, in the elements and all of that, chanting, fuming with rage, see that? Fuming with rage, but you don't have knowledge. See what I'm saying? So you can believe and belief can drive passion. And we've seen belief do that. In fact, I think belief is one of the greatest fuels for passion. What people believe can drive them to even give their lives for it, right? But like suicide bombers, for instance, they are taught something and they believe it. But do you have knowledge? Do you have accurate knowledge? Have you considered both sides? So saints of God, this is not about faith. This is not about belief. This is about knowledge. We've got to know. Paul said, and we know, and we know. We have to know. Don't just believe you've got, belief is good. Belief is for newcomers. Belief is for coming in because you can't know everything before you come into the kingdom. So God says, okay, I'll make it very easy for everyone. And that's a smart God for you. Because think about it. If God said you have to have a, a degree in theology before you can be saved. <laughs> oh my God. How many people will be saved? Right? But he says, no, we're not going to go that route just for you to come into the kingdom. If you can just believe and believe is cheap, believe everybody can believe. So Somebody shares a testimony, preaches a message, tells you about Jesus. You don't see him. You don't know about it. You can't prove it. But something within you tells you this, this, this is believable. And it's okay, I believe. He said, okay, that's it. Now, but look at what scripture says. It is not God's desire that any man should perish, but that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. See that? So salvation is the belief part. But come to the knowledge of truth goes beyond just believing. It is actually knowing. It's actually coming with understanding. That's why you have the Holy Spirit. He's called the spirit of wisdom and understanding. You see that? That's the Holy Spirit. He's called the spirit of revelation, wisdom, and revelation. So he reveals so that you have wisdom, you gain understanding. And when you gain understanding, you can, see, you can believe what you know. You know it, but you don't just believe it. So this desire to overcome the dragon comes with knowledge. Belief and faith will not fuel this desire. 
Now, inspired scripture establishes for the reader, again, this is why it's critical, most, a lot of folks don't read the Bible. Even churchgoers don't read their Bible. They are waiting for pastor to read for them and then come and regurgitate, come and vomit on them. No, you've got to read for yourself. Don't you know, child of God, that you have the same Holy Spirit your leaders have, right? They have been called to do, carry out a certain ministry at a certain level, but you have also been called to carry out, even if you say you don't believe you have a ministry, at least relationship with the Holy Spirit. And you'll be amazed what God will reveal to you. You'll be amazed what the Holy Spirit will show you from scriptures. You've got to read. So inspired scripture, again, don't forget why we call it inspired. It's not everything that is in the Bible, but everything that is inspired by God. That is what man lives by. So life, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So every word that proceeds from the mouth of God carries life carries life. It's a living word. It's able to produce life in those who receive it or those who embrace it. So that's why you got to read. If you're waiting on Sunday, waiting for Sunday to Sunday or waiting for the next service so you can hear your preacher, what about, and probably you only have two or three services per week, what about the other days? What about the other days? So you, you really, you're really catching up I mean, at a, at a slow pace, but you want to have daily interaction with the Holy Spirit, daily interaction. Make yourself available for the Holy Spirit who is called the teacher to actually teach you. See that? He is the teacher. You are the student. Have you been to class? Have you been to the school of his presence? Have you been to the school of the knowledge of the Spirit? If you don't make yourself available to be taught by the Holy Spirit, how are you going to be taught? See that? And unfortunately, these days, so many preachers don't preach the word of God. They don't teach the word of God. It's now philosophies of men, traditions of men, self-glorification, you know, manifesting how anointed they are. It's all about all, all lights, camera, and action on them. Come see anointed man. Come see, you know, it's not about really Ephesians 4.11, equipping the saints. He himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the edifying, the build up, the build up of the saints for the work of service or of the ministry so that we all can come to the knowledge. See that again? Come to the knowledge. Of the son of God. Are we doing that? Is our church is doing that? Is your pastor doing that? What was the last knowledge you gained in church? Bible knowledge that you gained. I'm not talking about the amusement. I'm not talking about the entertainment. I'm talking about you learned something new from the Bible. When was the last time? These things are critical. Knowledge. So inspired scriptures that come from the presence of God, that come through the inspiration of the Spirit, will establish for the reader. So there's got to be the reader, the student, the disciple of Jesus, will establish for the reader a body of truth upon which knowledge can be built. See that? This knowledge comes as we go through the body of truth that is revealed in scripture and that comes through the inspired word of God or inspired through the spirit of God. So inspired scripture gives a worldview. Please take note of that. This is so critical. We've talked about this a little bit a while ago, but we're coming back to it. What is your worldview? Every person must have a worldview. Your worldview shapes who you are. Your worldview determines how you interact with the world. Your worldview will either prepare you for the days to come or probably not prepare you for the days to come. What is your worldview? What worldview drives you? What worldview are you riding on? Are you, are you, are you living by? Your worldview matters. Your worldview is very critical. And I'm saying to us, scriptures actually give us a worldview. There's a worldview that scripture paints to us. Do we know what that worldview is about? Because if, if, you, if we don't, then we're just going to be following other worldviews presented by other sources. 
presented by other sources. You've got to understand every ideology that you embrace presents a worldview to you, right? Every ideology you present presents a worldview to you. So what worldview are you living for? What worldview are you living by? What worldview drives you? Very critical. Scriptures present a worldview of its own. And every child of God, every uh, Bible student, every Bible reader, every professing follower of Christ ought to know the worldview that the Bible presents. That's number one. Number two, are you in alignment with the worldview that the Bible presents? If you're not, then you cannot say you're a student of the Bible. If your worldview is shaped by something other than the word of God, then you can't say you are a follower of Christ. Oh my God, it's getting critical, people. So I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. Okay, Christian, how? how? How are you a Christian? I go to church. No, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Going to church makes you a church goer. <laughs> See that? Going to church just makes you a church goer. What makes you a follower of Christ? means you're following the worldview that Christ presented. It means you're following the teachings of Christ. You're following the message of Christ. You're following the life of Christ. See that? So Christ is your leader. You're following in his footstep. Then you can say you are a Christian, one who follows Christ. So let's quickly look at an extract, just a small extract from biblical worldviews. I say small, but it's quite big. <laughs> an extract from biblical worldview. And that's going to take us to Revelation 13. And I'm going to read the whole thing from us 1 to 10. And the reason I'm doing this, I want to give you a background. I want to give you, I want to give us a uh, uh, context for where we're going. We've got to have context for where we're going. All right, Revelation 13. And that's all we're going to do today, by the way. So Revelation 13 from verse 1 to 10. Here is verse 1. Then I stood, and please pay attention to these things. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Verse 2, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Verse 3, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Look at that. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. So they followed the beast, but didn't know they were actually worshiping the dragon because the dragon was behind the beast. Don't forget, I just read to you, gave him his power, gave him his authority, gave him his throne. So the beast is acting on behalf of the dragon. We're going to come to what these things mean. Verse four, so they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verse 5, and he, the beast, was given a mouth, <laughs> speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months, just three and a half years. Verse 6, then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Okay. Verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Verse 9, if anyone has an ear, uh, let him hear. It's interesting that scriptures will even point to that. Just to let us know how critical these things are. Do we have ears to hear, people of God? Does today's church have ears to hear? 
Do we have an ear? Okay, do you even say two? An ear. If you have one, only one ear is enough. <laughs> if you can just hear a little. Verse 10. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. And then it goes on to wrap it up by saying, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, we're going to come back to this later on. The only reason I'm going into it right now is I need to give us a backdrop context for where we're going with the subject that we're dealing with right now. All right, so let's try to explain some of these things here. So without going into depth, here is a summary of the chapter. So it started off in verse 1. In verse 1, John was shown a prophetic vision where he observes a beast rise out of the sea. Okay? Don't forget it's a prophetic vision. So a prophetic vision means it, it, it pertains to prophecy. It pertains to, you know, uh, uh, human destiny. It pertains to, to, to human existence. It pertains to something you know that that has to do with the, the god the orchestration of god it's something that humans ought to be aware of and also when you say it's prophetic it also means it, you you cannot you know relegate it to to the past and say it has no relevance to the future or to the present you can say that because it is prophetic there's a reason why think about it let me just make this argument before i go on and I'm saying this because there are people who hold that view. There are people who hold one of the views of eschatology that say it is all in the past. It, it has nothing to do with the present. It has nothing to do with us. It's all in the past. But here's one argument you got to deal with. Number one, here it is. So John was living in a particular era, particular period in time. But when the prophetic vision was shown him, it takes him back in time. So it means for John, the past was relevant, at least from the perspective of the angel or the perspective of the Lord God who was showing the visions. See that? So John was not orchestrating these visions. John had no hand in it. He was in the island of Patmos where he had been banished for his uh, you know, testimony of Jesus Christ and his faith. He was just waiting for death, by the way. And here comes the Lord Jesus, right? The Lord Jesus shows up and tells him, what I'm about to show you, what you have seen, what you have seen, what you have seen in the past, what you're seeing right now, and what I'm going to show you, write. And when you write it, send it to the seven churches in Asia. See that? And so the visions began to open. And so the Lord Jesus sending an angel to show John the past. Jesus didn't say, oh, no, I am of the view that if it's in the past, it's gone. <laughs> it has no relevance to you. Let me show you only present time and show you future. You don't have to deal with the past. Jesus didn't say that. But not only did Jesus show John the past, he actually tells him, write it down, document it, and literally send it to the churches. So not only is it important to you, John, it's also important to my churches, at least the churches of the time. See that? So Jesus took, same thing with Moses, the, the, the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch, which would be the five books, the first five books of the Bible. They were all in the narrative given to Moses. God saw the need to show Moses the past, shows him a vision of the past, shows him vision of creation, shows him the vision of the first man, shows him how the woman was formed, shows him the serpent, shows him all of that that transpired in the garden that led to where you are right now. You can't relegate, when it's prophetic, you can't relegate it to the past alone. That's why it's prophetic. If it is prophetic, it has relevance to what God is doing. So John is shown this vision, prophetic vision, where he observes a beast rise out of the sea, all right? Now, here's my explanation. The term beast is used throughout scripture. You're gonna check this out. Throughout scripture in reference to strategic governmental powers and kingdoms that shape human history. Now I use the word shape, which is continuous present because it's an ongoing reality. The vision, spoke of the past, but it is an unfolding vision. 
it's an unfolding vision because it carries on till the very end. As a matter of fact, Revelation 20.10, when Satan himself is bound and cast into the lake of fire, that's his final judgment. So even Satan is judged in the vision. So the vision goes from the beginning of time or the beginning of human cre beginning of creation to the end of this present life. So it's, a, it's an ongoing vision. So I use the, the present continuous tense. So the term beast, when the Bible says beast, when you look at the Old Testament has given us the patterns for that, beast is often usually used throughout scripture in reference to strategic governmental powers and kingdoms that shape human history. Go and read the book of Daniel. Go and read the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, uh, Alexander the Great, the Medo Persians, the Roman Empire, all of those. These are kingdoms. These are human kingdoms. And they were referred to as beasts. So, borrowing from that prophetic uh, insight, we can understand what's going on here. But the term C is also used in reference to people, multitudes, and nations of the earth. And you find that in Revelation 17, verse 15. He said, the waters that you saw over which the woman sat, those are multitudes, those are peoples, those are nations, those are tongues and tribes and, and peoples of the earth. So in this vision, we see the sea, the, the, uh, the, the beast rises up out of the sea. So it's over the sea. So we, is, you can interpret it to be the same because the beast is sitting over these waters. So which, what does that tell you? It tells you it's a government rising out of the people. It is a, a, a political power rising out of the people. It is a kingdom of sort. Now, when you say kingdom, don't just look at physical kingdom. There are spiritual kingdoms as well. It's a kingdom rising out from amongst the people, out from amongst the earth, rising out from amongst the nations, rising out from amongst multitudes of people. So this actually sounds like a one world government or a global government. And by the way, we have the benefit of um, unfolding history to better understand the scriptures. When our forebears and our elder brothers tried to interpret some of this text, they didn't have the kind of uh, knowledge base that we have today. For instance, you know, I mean, globalism is, has been a subject for a very long time now. But, you know, some of our brethren then didn't know what, who, if, you, if, they, if you had mentioned globalism then or globalization, they would be like, what are you talking about? We were still having Cold War. It was Cold War between America and Russia. Who is stronger? Is it America or is it Russia? You know? So, so that was what they had. But now we have better understanding because now we've, heard, we've now heard the, 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 the globalist agenda rising up very strong. So scriptures already show us it's going there. So this is a global government. It's a one world kind of government. All right? Again, like I said, we'll come back to this, but I got to just move on for time's sake so we can lay the groundwork for the subject we're dealing with. So the beast or government was shown in the vision had seven heads, 10 horns, 10 crowns on its on the on the 10 horns, and a name of blasphemy on its head. A name of blasphemy on its head. What would that mean? We've already been told the seven heads are seven mountains over which the government sits. Okay. The, the, the in Revelation 17, verse 9, it's a woman, and I explained that to you to us. So the seven heads are seven mountains over which the government sits, a global government, a one world kind of system, a global system, a global governmental kind of system, but now sits over or controls the seven mountains, right? And you find that in Revelation 17 verse 9. And for our purposes, when we looked at the subject of the seven mountains, this is how we got it, you know, uh, let me not say Holy Spirit gave us. So some people think, uh, are you the only one who has Holy Spirit? No, we, <laughs> I'm not saying that. But the way we got it was spirituality, science and technology, art, family, government, commerce, and academia. And we try to explain why we didn't choose some of the other terms that people use. For instance, some people say religion. Okay, we didn't choose religion for a specific reason, right? Some people will say uh, 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 media. We didn't choose media for a specific reason, right? And we explained this in the sub in the, when we looked at the subjects. We didn't choose ec economics, for instance, in instead of commerce. We didn't choose economics. We didn't choose business. We didn't choose those terms for a specific reason. We chose these and we explained why. Then 
We didn't choose education, for instance, and we explained why. We chose academia, and we explained why also. So those were the seven that, and we dealt with all seven. All right, so explanation. The name of blasphemy on the seven heads suggests that all seven mountains of society, listen to this sense of God, all seven mountains of society are taken over by the dragon. <clears throat> there is your uh, going up to the high places to tear the devil's kingdom down. Scripture doesn't show that. <clears throat> Scripture doesn't show that the church dethrones Satan. Scripture doesn't show that the, the church dethrones the devil from the high places. No, what scripture shows us is an angel came from heaven with one chain in his hand and he bound the dragon and chained him and cast him into the bottomless pit. That's what scripture shows. Scripture didn't show apostle this or prophet that or the combination of apostles and prophets. Dethrone. No, it didn't show that. So while we are in, in our exuberance and passion, let's not concoct our own theology. Let's follow scriptures. Let's follow scriptures, all right? So it shows us that the seven mountains are taken over by the dragon using these forces, all right? But not only is it taken over, his name, his mark, don't forget the name of the beast, the mark of the beast, the number of its name, or even worship of the beast. These are the four things scriptures talk about. So we know all four were plastered on the seven mountains. And you see that in Revelation, in, in Revelation 13, verse 2, where he said, and the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, his authority. You see that? It's a beast in the physical world, but the dragon is in the spiritual realm, furnishing, supplying, doing things. So whatever the beast is projecting to the world was literally coming from the dragon. But you also see it in Revelation 17, verse 5, where it says, John saw the woman, he said, and when I saw this woman, she was filled with blasphemy, a name of blasphemy. And he read the name to me, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and all the abominations of the earth. So that's the blasphemy. But it's not just going to be those literal words. It's, it's literally the name of the dragon, the name of Satan. And those who can't carry, I mean, can't you see how people are recklessly using the name of Satan these days? That's why you young people have to be careful. Your concerts you're going to. Now they are flashing Satan on the on the uh, on the platform, and you are just dancing, just shaking your head. They are flashing Satan, you are dancing. What is that? You're worshiping Satan. That's what they are leading you to. Those celebrities have become, you know, uh, uh they call them celebrities, they become agents of Satan. They lures the souls of men to Satan worship. And some are very bold to tell you, hey, you, you all can't escape it. You, since you are here, we are going to hell together. One of them actually said that. We are going to hell together. And you are saying, yeah, oh my Lord. It's happening already, people of God. It's already happening. So when that is done, it then means that people who wish to ascend the mountains will be required to pledge allegiance to the dragon. Isn't it already happening at a small scale where if you don't belong to a cult, <laughs> you don't belong to a clique, you don't belong to a sorority, you don't belong to a fraternity, you're not recognized, right? You put in an application, you're the best qualified for the position, but they give it to somebody who is incompetent or at least not as good as you are just because you didn't pledge sorority. You see that? That's what's going on. So eventually it's all going to culminate into what scripture already says it's going to be. So those who want to ascend the mountain will have to pledge allegiance. And by the way, this thing started many years ago, going back to the days of, of uh, 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 Joseph in Egypt, Daniel in Babylon, and so on and so forth. All right. So the ten horns, talk about the ten horns. The ten horns are human kings. Human kings over strategic operations on the mountains. And we see that in Revelation 17, verse 12. The 10 kings are the 10 horns are 10 kings. All right. They are crowned because it says the 10 horns are crowned. So they are crowned over those areas, those areas of specialty. Now, let me explain something quickly. I do not think, this is me, I do not think those 10 kings are kings over earthly nations, as in, you know, United Kingdom. No, I don't think so. 
And why do I say that? Because don't forget, it's a one world, if we, if we say this is a one world government, it that means that all of the governments are subservient to this one world government. So who are these kings then? These are kings of things. These are kings of, of, of strategic operations. I don't want to mention names. I don't want to mention things. But, but when you look in our society today, you can see some humans have risen up. They are kings over things. They are experts in certain things. They are the go-to people when it comes to certain things. Now, watch this. Satan doesn't have all the... Oh, my Lord. I wish we would get this. Satan doesn't have all the expertise. Satan doesn't have all the knowledge. In fact, some people were, were blessed by God with certain knowledge. And Satan, all he can do is take a hold of that person, pervert that knowledge, and use it for his glory. Not that he has the knowledge. He just brings that, wants to make sure that person comes to his side and uses that knowledge for his own glory, which is why we tell you, Dedicate your service to the Lord. Dedicate your art to the Lord. Dedicate your science to the Lord. Dedicate your gifts to the Lord. Because if you don't, Satan is coming for it. If it's good, if it's one that rises to the top, Satan will come for it. He needs it. He needs it. He will come for it. These are experts. And because they are experts, the global powers will need them. Because they are experts, Satan will need them. So look at that. They are strate strategic operations require expertise, right? I mean, if you know how to write a certain program, for instance, and you're the only one who handles how to write the program, hey, you become valuable. So Satan will want to grab you and bring you to his side, pay you whatever you want, pay him the money, just let him serve us. But then you're going to sign a contract. And it's not just on ink, it's in blood. It's going to be in blood. It's a covenant. So these kings, I believe, are experts in certain things, experts in strategic things. Look at what's going on in the world. You will see how some things are very strategic, very, very strategic. Whoever has them is like powerful. So Satan is going to harness all of them. And you can see more of that in Revelation 17 and verse 13. The Bible says they gave their authority to the beasts. They gave their 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 their, their power their agreement, their alignment to the beast, and by extension, to the dragon. So in verse 2, critical. This is what happens in verse 2. In verse 2, Revelation 13, verse 2, the vision begins to show different manifestations of the same beast. Also notice in, the v, in that verse 2, we see the gender adjective for a male, not a female. He's as opposed to her, when you get to Revelation 17. What is going on there? First and foremost, the various beasts that were represented, because John said the beast that I saw was like a leopard. But it goes on, it says it has the foot of a bear. It has the mouth of a lion. Okay, what are you talking about? And it says he, he was given. So it's a male. So the various beasts described in verse 2 refer to the various manifestations and attempt of the dragon, Satan, to advance his agenda on earth through different human governments represented by each of the beasts. And Daniel explained that very, 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 very well. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 to 8. So the vision of Revelation 13 that we're looking at now showed a period when it was a male figure who was the human leader of the satanic agenda. But when you get to Revelation 17, it showed a period when a female figure was the human leader of the satanic agenda. That's why I call it a woman. I call it a woman because it, so John is seeing different time frames, different phases of the same agenda, different phases of the same satanic agenda, different phases. Now he sees a man, he's a he, oh, now it's a woman. Because again, we know from Bible, there was a time when it was a woman who spearheaded Satan's operations on the earth. Ah, yeah. It was a woman, very popular name, Jezebel. You all know her. It was a woman at one point was a woman at one point, but at first he was a man. Pharaoh was a man. Nebuchadnezzar, a man. But one time, here comes a woman. 
So scriptures are very rich on these things, very, very clear on these things. All right. So, so no, go back. <laughs> so the vision of 13, a man, vision of 17, a woman. But the various body parts described in the vision simply show the strategic inputs each of those leaders made. Strategic leaders made strategic inputs. I have explained this some time ago in another message. You know, we see the term Jezebel mentioned in the book of Revelation. Why is the name Jezebel in Revelation when the actual Jezebel happened in the Old Testament in the days of Elijah? Because Jezebel, the woman, daughter of Ethabal, this was a, a, a young woman who the father, you know, taught sorcery and introduced her to Satan worship and all of that. And she took it to another level. But she succeeded so much and she was so dedicated in her service, in her worship of Satan, that her name became a legacy in Satanic Kingdom. Not only did her name become a legacy in Satanic Kingdom, in fact, an operational uh, a code or a code for an operation was tagged after her name. You know what I mean? We do it here even in modern time. Somebody doesn't really, it's okay, we'll call it Operation Francis, right? Or we'll call it the Francis Bill. <laughs> the Francis Bill, just to memorialize it. So Satan memorialized that operation that this woman brought in. So that was the input say, uh, uh, Jezebel made. Now, what was the input so strategic? What was the input to come as a prophet or a prophetess, seduce men of God and lure them to fornication. <laughs> Jezebel brought that idea and Satan said, whoa, we can run with that. And so he strategically tagged it, Jezebel. And so he ran through scriptures that to the point that the prophetic vision and revelation picked it up by the same name. So I'm saying the same thing is going on here. So when it says the, the, the beast that I saw was like a leopard, there was a specific kingdom at work at this time. But as John is looking, he now sees other inputs from other kingdoms. He says that the feet are like the feet of a bear, all right? But the mount, like the mount of a lion. The lion actually is Nebuchadnezzar, I can tell you that straightforward. The bear, I think, was Alexander the Great, the time of Alexander the Great. But here's what is strategic. Because when Bible uses an animal, check that animal, study that animal. There's something about that animal that applies to what the scriptures is trying to say. Bear, what are bears known for? Even in the United States economy, there's what we call the bear economy. What is the bear? We have the bear and the bull economy. The bull economy is when the economy is doing well. The bear economy is when the economy is going downwards. And it comes from the fact that the bear claws down. So the bear will stand on the two hind feet and so towers over its uh, 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 you know, opponent, whatever the, the opponent is, and then uses its claws to claw down. See that? So this beast was known to do that. So this is a kingdom that clawed down, that acted like a bear. It will claw down, will tear down and destroy but I also think it has to do with the economy also because we call it the bear economy. So it's a kingdom that learned how to use the economy to subdue people. How, that's why you're going to see later on, he said, oh, and he gave a commandment that nobody can buy or sell. See that? Except those who have received the mark. What is he doing? Bear economy. He's using the bear strategy that he learned from that kingdom. Oh, Lord. But let, let's leave that for time's sake. Let's talk about the lion. It says the mouth of a lion. Well, what, what, what is the strategic thing about the lion? The roar of the lion. What is the roar compared to what the scripture is saying here? Propaganda. Terror campaign. That's right. Communication strategy and propaganda strategy. The lion is known to roar from a distance. And the roar fills the atmosphere that the animals of the prey, if they accept they see, they don't know where the lion is actually coming from. So the roar goes ahead of the lion, sending terror. It terrifies the beast of prey. The roar terrifies them that they're running in all directions. In fact, some are running towards the lion, except they actually see, oh, that's where it is. And then they run the other direction. So they learned 
Oh, propaganda works. They learned terror campaign works. They learned having powerful communication skills to say one thing while you're doing another thing. It works because that's the lion. It roars, it fills the air. You think it's coming from here, but it's coming from the other angle. And so they took that also. And actually that came from Nebuchadnezzar. How do I know that? Daniel chapter four, Daniel chapter two. Thor says King Nebuchadnezzar, king of kings, kings of the whole world, king of the whole world. When you hear the sound of the clarinet and the cymbal and the trombone and the horn and all of that, you must bow to the image. If you don't bow, we're going to heat up the fire seven times and it will burn you alive. Oh my God, everybody terrified. Oh Lord, we're going to die. We're going to die. Once the things start blowing, everybody's bowing straight. Terror campaign. That was Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was so pompous in his boast and in his terror campaign and propaganda that God had to humble him. So no, there's a God in heaven who is higher than you. Shut up, little man terror campaign. So I'm saying this to say, and this is not my subject today, but I got to say, saints of God, those days will come. It's going to be terror campaign. It's going to be terror. You don't do that, we'll shut you down. We'll kill you. If you don't do that, you'll lose it. It's going to be terror campaign. A lot of people will submit to the dragon out of the fear of the terror campaign, even before the actual threat gets to them. The terror campaign will hit them. That's the terror campaign. And you see more of that in verse, uh, when you read verse four to seven, remember when they were saying, oh, great is this beast. Who is able to make war with her? That's, that's terror campaign. So it's a campaign of showing I am the most powerful. Nobody can challenge me. And everybody was bowing for that. The Bible said everybody was, mar everybody marveled. Who can make war with this beast? Terror campaign. All right, let's move on for time's sake. Now verse eight is my point and I'm wrapping it up now. Verse eight is the, my main point here. So scripture says, with all of that going on, look, watch this. All saints of God, please get this. This is the worldview. Scriptures, the Lord God, the angel who is showing this to John, is of the opinion that all who dwell on the earth will. Now, observe. I got to say something about that. It's not by force. Even though it's a terror campaign and... It's almost like leaving no room for escape, no way out. It's still going to be the people's will. He's still, because if Satan forces you to worship him, then it's not worship. Same thing with God. God doesn't force people to worship. It, worship has to come from your will. Worship has to be something that you give freely. You give with understanding that the person deserves it. So it will make it difficult, but it still will not force it on the people. All who dwell on the earth will worship the dragon. But he took, the angel took note and was telling John, those whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That is the worldview. All who dwell on the earth who have not been whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world will eventually worship the beast. So humans are no match for this force in the absence of the lamb of God. That is the biblical worldview. Now you can believe whatever you want to believe is up to you. But scripture shows us humans are no match for this force if it's not for the blood of Jesus, if it's not for the blood of the lamb. And this lamb, it tells us, was slain from the foundation of the world. So because, because of that, uh, elsewhere it says it's slain. Uh, notice also that the lamb was slain from, it says from the foundation of the world. But elsewhere it says before the foundation of the world. And you find that in John chapter 17, verse 5, John 17, verse 24, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, he uses before the foundation of the world. So that means the father had this worked out even before humans showed up on the scene. So what we're talking about came was done even before humans were formed. So humans, you can't change it. Humans, don't go looking for anything else. It was even done before humans were formed, before the foundation of the world. 
So now that we have seen the conclusion of the matter, don't forget the prophetic vision is coming from the end and looking back in time. So we've seen the end. We've seen the conclusion of the matter. We've seen how it all ends. We now have knowledge. Now you can say, I believe, I know. What have we learned today? Scriptures clearly shows us all whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world cannot defeat the dragon. They will worship the dragon. Oh, see, now I know. It's not belief. I, I believe, I believe God would take me out from here before that. You just wish, you, we, that's wishful talking. You don't know that. You can prove it. But now we know. I know scripture says, if I don't receive the lamb, if I don't receive the blood of the lamb that was slain before the world was formed, then ultimately I'm going to worship the devil, I'm going to worship the dragon. Now I know that. So what do I do now? Now that you have knowledge, that knowledge will then guide our studies going forward. So as we proceed from next class, uh, I want us to have this in mind. This is the ultimate goal. So what we're doing is to ensure that we don't worship the beast. Don't forget, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the devil has come down amongst you, having great wrath, for he knows his time is short. So all who do not have the lamb, all who have not been written in the lamb's book of life, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, will worship the beast. That now makes you take decisive steps before that time comes or before anything happens. So what knowledge have we gained again? All who do not embrace and understand the event and the efficacy of the slain lamb of God will ultimately worship the dragon. So in our next lesson, we'll go back in time. We'll now go back in time because it says the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world before the world was formed. So we're going to go back to foundation of the world before the world was formed to see the lamb slain and to see how God plotted this event before it actually manifested in time. So we're going to go back in time to the foundation of the world to gain knowledge of what the blood of the lamb represents. And we're going to leave it at that. Father, we give you thanks. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your dominion. Thank you for the word <clears throat> done for us today. Thank you for the insights given. Thank you for the revelation. Thank you for the knowledge we've received. Thank you for the understanding we've received. And these things are coming, Lord, to equip us. For you gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip your saints. It is our hope, it is our prayer that we're indeed equipping your saints, that we're indeed equipping those that you've given to us. It is our hope, it is our desire, it is our prayer that, Lord, you are infusing us all with strength, with knowledge, with understanding, <clears throat> understanding that will equip us, that will strengthen us in our inner man. We don't just want to have blind faith, but we want to have faith rooted in knowledge. Hallelujah. Faith rooted in understanding. Faith rooted in the word of God. Not faith that we concocted. Not faith in traditions of men. Not faith in relig religiosity. Not faith in human, <clears throat> human preaching and human stuff. No, but faith in the authority of scriptures. So, Lord, I pray for my brothers and my sisters. I pray for all who are right now under the sound of my voice and those who will listen and watch later in the days to come. The Lord, you will infuse us with the strength that we need for this time. But more so, Lord, open our understanding. Illuminate our knowledge base. Illuminate our understanding. Give us insight that only comes from the Spirit. For man lives by the inspired word of God. We receive the inspired word of truth that is able to save us, that is able to build us up, by which we may live also. And we give you thanks for it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen and amen until we come your way again shortly. Stay elevated. We love you and God bless you. Bye-bye now.